Hello everybody. Well, I hope this finds you all doing really well today. Hard to believe that we're to the middle of April already, but I hope you've had a great week. And today I'd like to talk for a few minutes with you about a man in the Old Testament by the name of Abraham. Maybe you've heard of Abraham. There's a lot written about him in the Old Testament. You know, we first meet Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 when his name is Abram. You know, God invites Abram into a relationship with himself, and he asks him to do a couple of things. He asks him to leave his family and his homeland and travel to a new country. And God promises him if he will do that, God will bless him, God will make a great name for him, and God will bless all the people of the entire world through Abraham. Well, Abraham does. He sets off from his home country and he begins to travel to this new country. And along the way, God makes a covenant with Abram. And when he does, God changes Abram's name from Abram to Abraham. Well, in the journey, Abraham encounters a few hiccups. Now, most of us have that happen to us in life. Life isn't always smooth sailing, is it? We run up against some things that we don't plan on and it kind of alters things for us. And that was the case with Abraham also. Abraham begins his journey in what's modern day Iran. That's where he lived. He travels through Iran into Iraq, travels through Iraq up into Turkey. Uh, once he's in Turkey, he drops down into what is now modern-day Syria, and ultimately he ends up in what is modern-day Israel. It's a journey of over 7,500 miles. Now, to put that in a little bit of perspective for you and me, it would be like us starting a journey in Miami, Florida. We walk from Miami to Columbus, Ohio. Then we walk from Columbus, Ohio down to Dallas, Texas. Then we walk from Dallas, Texas to San Francisco, California, and that would be about half of the journey that Abraham took. You know, if Abraham averaged 20 miles a day, it would have taken him over a year to make that journey. So uh, I want to see this little uh, experience that Abraham had and maybe allow it to teach us some things that's relevant for our lives today. So we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. If you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, that would be great. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. You may have a different translation, but you know what? I think you'll be able to track with me on this. So Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, this is what it says. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negeb, and he lived between Kadesh and Shur, and he sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So Abraham meets the king of Gerar. His name is Abimelech. And for some reason, he tells Abimelech that Sarah is his sister. And what does Abimelech do? Well, Abimelech takes Sarah as his wife because she's a beautiful woman. Why in the world would Abraham do that? Well, I believe it's because Abraham was suffering from what we suffer from sometimes, and that is fear based on what ifs. Fear based on what ifs. Not based on facts, not based on reality, but fear based on what might happen to us. Now our story continues in Genesis chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. This is what it says. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man. Because of the woman you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now Abimelech had not approached her. So he said, Lord, will you kill an innocent people? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hand, I have done this. 
Well, how would you like to have been Abimelech and have that kind of a dream where God says to you, you're a dead man? Man, that would ruin your whole day, wouldn't it? Well, Abimelech didn't know that Sarah was Abraham's wife. Abraham's fear led him to lie. Abimelech, he pleads with God, I haven't been intimate with her. I'm innocent. I haven't done anything with her. Abraham told me that she was his sister. Heck, even she herself said that Abraham was my brother. I can imagine Abimelech thinking, God, what the heck's going on here? You see, sometimes our fear of the what ifs can impact other people's lives in a negative way. It did here. We continue in Genesis chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. This is what it says. Then God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from her. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet so that he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Well, when I read that, I get this sense that Abimelech has more integrity than Abraham does. God will spare Abimelech's life if he returns Sarah to Abraham. Well, our story continues, Genesis chapter 20, verses 8 and 9. This is what it tells us. So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? And how have I sinned against you? that you have brought this on me and my kingdom, this great sin. You have done to me things that ought not to be done. So Abimelech, he confronts and exposes Abraham's deception. He confronts and exposes it both to Abraham and to Abimelech's people. Now Abimelech's people, they're afraid because negative things had already been happening to them because of what Abraham did. And we're going to see in a few minutes what those negative things already were. Now in the next verse, this is what we read, Genesis 20, verse 10. And Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you see that you did this thing? Isn't that a great question? What did you see, Abraham, that caused you to do what you did? You know, the fear of what ifs causes us to do that sometimes. You know, there's nothing imminent. There's nothing concrete. There's nothing of substance that we base our fear on. It's just we're afraid of the what ifs. What if this happens? What if that happens? That's what we're afraid of. You know, I think there's a great deal of that happening in our country right now. I think there's a great deal of that happening in our world right now. What if this? What if that? What if this occurs? Look at how Abraham responds to Abimelech in the next verse. Genesis 20, verse 11. Abraham said, I did it because I thought... There is no fear of God at all in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. I did it because I thought. I thought. Fear based on what ifs. Abraham thought the people of Palestine didn't fear God, and they were going to kill him. You know, sometimes, doggone it, we don't know as much as we think we do. And that was part of Abraham's problem. You know, God wasn't going to let anything happen to Abraham because there was a promise yet to be fulfilled. The world was yet to receive the blessing of God through Abraham. Nothing was going to happen to Abraham until that promise was fulfilled. Interestingly, 
This wasn't the first or only time that Abraham had done this. He had done it previously in Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 13. This is what it says. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared for your sake. You know what? I think Abraham's been living in fear probably this entire journey that he's been on. He's afraid somebody is going to kill him. It wasn't based on fact. It was based on what ifs. Now our story continues in Genesis chapter 20, verse 12. This is what it says. Besides, she is indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Goodness, Abraham does what we do sometimes. He tries to justify his fear. When we make excuses for our fear, like Abraham was doing here, it just gives the devil all the more opportunities in our lives. Don't you just want to kind of shout to Abraham here, stop it, stop it all. Stop making excuses for your fear. Stop being afraid. Well, in the next verse, we see something else also. Genesis 20, verse 13. This is Abraham speaking. He says, And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, This is the kindness you must do me. At every place to which we come, say of me, He is my brother. Do you see what Abraham does here? He blames his fear on God. He blames his fear on God, saying, well, ever since God made me take this trip. You know, we do that sometimes too. God, if you haven't put me, if you didn't put me in this situation, I wouldn't have the fear in the first place. I want to remind us of something that the Apostle Paul once wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7. Paul wrote this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Fear isn't something God gives us. If it's not coming from God, where's it coming from? It's either something we've created in our minds or it's coming from the devil. But we can't blame it on God like Abraham was trying to do here. Abraham was trying to blame all kinds of things and all kinds of people except taking responsibility for himself for the fear. Well, we continue in Genesis chapter 20, verses 14 through 16. This is what it tells us. Then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and he gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you and before everyone you are vindicated. Abimelech, in his integrity, strives to make everything right, including vindicating Sarah of any responsibility of all of this. You know, Sarah had very little input or control over what Abraham was doing. 
Well, we're going to finish up in Genesis chapter 20, verses 17 and 18, with the rest of this section of this story. This is what it tells us. Then Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, and also healed his wife and female slaves, so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Do you see what had already been happening to Abimelech's people? Do you see why they were already afraid of what was going on? The women of Gerar, the women in Abimelech's life, had become sterile because of Abraham's fear. You know, our fear of what ifs can impact our lives in a negative way. Our fear of the what ifs can also impact other people's lives in negative ways too. So today, I want to call all of us not to live in the fear of the what ifs, but to live in the reality that God will take care of us, whether or not the what ifs ever come to be. So, um, you know, one of Jesus's consistent messages in the New Testament, in the Gospels, to people and to his disciples was a two-word sentence. Fear not. Fear not. God doesn't want us to live in fear. I'd like to say a prayer for us as we close that we wouldn't live in fear. Let's have a prayer together. Father, help us in the power of your Holy Spirit not to live in the fear of the what-ifs, but to be grounded in your love, in your promises to us that you are going to take care of us in all of our situations. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me today. I hope to see you soon. God bless you till I see you again.